Welcome to St. James. My name is Emily Hughes and I am so excited that you are joining us today. You might be at home on your couch in your PJs, you might be at church in your PJs, or you might be at church in your dress clothes or whatever. We are just so excited that you are joining us. We are going to be talking about following the leader. And you guys have followed leaders before. You might have played the game Follow the Leader where you pick somebody and they want to see how long you can follow them and do whatever they do. So when you play this game, the person is going to try to get everybody else out by doing things that are absolutely crazy. So they might say, all right, we're going to do 100 jumping jacks, and they're jumping up and down 100 times. Um, they might make you do something that's a little bit silly because they want to challenge you. Or you might have been the line leader at school before, and it was the best day ever because you got to be the leader and you got to have everybody else follow you. Either way, you guys know about following the leader. And so I want to show you guys a clip from the movie Peter Pan. And I want to tell you that this song might get stuck in your head, but it's a really good example of when we follow the leader. John, you be the leader. I shall try to be worthy of my post. Good. Come on, Dad. Michael, do be careful. Come on, Wendy. I'll show you the mermaids. Following the leader, the leader, the leader. We're following the leader wherever he may go. So that was pretty fun, right? Every time I listen to that, I'm like, following the leader, the leader. And I'm dancing around. I'm having a good time. And so hopefully that was a catchy way to show you guys that we have leaders in our lives that we follow and we don't always dance and sing when we follow them but you have a lot of examples of leaders and those are people who want you to follow them into doing things and so the leaders that we should be following are people that are leading us into safety and leading us into kindness and leading us towards Christ. Um, if you think about leaders that you have in different places, if you think about school, school leaders are wanting to keep you safe and wanting to help you learn, right? So who could be a school leader for you? You probably thought about your teachers or your teacher's helpers or your lunch ladies. Um, if you think about if you played on a sports team, who could be your leader there? Your coach, right? Um, if you think about here at church, your leaders here are your parents and your friends or your parents' friends and people like me or your Sunday school teachers or our pastors. You have so many leaders here at church. And so the important thing to remember is that when you are following different leaders, that you are following people who are examples of Christ's love for us, right? They want to help you. They want to bring you into safe places. They want to help you serve other people. I want to show you guys um, a scripture from the book of Mark. And in this part of the book of Mark, we see that people are following their leader. So this is Mark chapter 1, verse 16. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So something that you need to know about this is it's not like they're actually catching people in a net, right? We don't need to do that. They don't need to do that. What's really happening is Jesus says, leave whatever you're doing and follow me. I'm going to show you how to help other people follow me as well. After reading this, I want to encourage you guys to follow the leader. Follow Jesus in everything that you do. And we know that he gave us examples of his love in our grown-ups that we trust and want to keep us safe and lead us into a life of serving others and creating a kind world and a great place to be for other people. Let's go ahead and pray together. 
Hey God, thank you so much that you have called us to follow you. Thank you for the examples of your love that you have given us in our grown-ups and in people that we trust and people that love us. May we go forward and continue to follow you. In your name I pray. Amen. I am standing here in front of the stage that used to be stone walls and castles and shields and flags and knights of the North Castle. So as you guys know, just last week we had VBS here and we just want to say thank you so much for all of your support in making it happen. I can't explain to you how special it was to see children back in our building worshiping. They were worshiping with everything they had. They knew those dance moves. They were singing the songs. And those songs are the very songs that I sing in my head when I am trying to sleep at night. But anyway, thank you so much for all of your support. If you donated a toilet paper roll, even just one, it became a dragon for a child. Um, if you came out and helped us set up, it made VBS that much more special for our children and also our volunteers. Um, if you kept us in your prayers, it made it happen. Thank you for trusting us with your children. Um, thank you for trusting us with this space. Thank you for everything that you have done to help make VBS successful this year. Um, there were times that we weren't sure it was going to happen. And then with prayers and support and all of the work that Day Juan did and the children's ministry team and everybody coming together, it made VBS happen. And so thank you so much. But I cannot say thank you alone. I have some people who want to share some messages with you. Thank you. Charlie, what's your favorite part about VBS so far? Science. Science? Okay, why? Because you get to shoot catapults and stuff. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you love VBS? 1,000. Exactly. Are you guys having fun at VBS? Yes. What's your favorite part so far? My favorite is the snack time. What about you, Olivia? I'm snack time. Thumbs up. Love it. Good job. What's your favorite part about volunteering at VBS? Definitely the song. All right, ladies, what is your favorite dance move from VBS? Awesome. Okay, what would you tell somebody who wants to volunteer for VBS? You should totally do it. In you, O oh Lord, we seek refuge. Never let us be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver us. Incline your ear to us. Rescue us speedily. Be a rock of refuge for us, a strong fortress to save us. You are indeed our rock and our fortress. For your name's sake, lead us and guide us. Take us out of the net which is hidden for us, for you are our refuge. Into your hand we commit our spirits. You have redeemed us, O Lord, faithful God. We hate those who pay regard to vain idols, but we trust in the Lord. We will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen our affliction and you have taken heed of our adversities. You've not delivered us into the hand of our enemy. You have set at our feet a broad place. Be gracious to us, O Lord, for we are in distress. Our eyes are wasted from grief, our souls and bodies also, for our life is spent with sorrow and our years with sighing. Our strength fails because of our misery and our bones waste away. We are the scorn of all our adversaries, a horror to our neighbors, an object of dread to our acquaintances, those who see us in the street flee from us. We have passed out of mind like one who is dead. We have become like a broken vessel. For we hear the whispering of many terror all around as they scheme together against us as they plot to take our lives. But we trust in you, O Lord. We say, you are our God. 
Our times are in your hand, O Lord. Deliver us from the hand of our enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine on your servants. Save us through your steadfast love. Our gospel reading today is John 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father, who dwells in me, does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I read this passage at almost every funeral where I officiate. It is a comforting passage to families who have lost a loved one to death. It is a comforting passage, yet it's also very much more But what is that much more? Well, that depends on who you ask. While the whole passage is often read at funerals, I tend to hear verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in other settings, settings that are not quite as comforting. Verse 6 is often used to put a fence around God, to declare or decide who gets to go to heaven when they die and who gets to go somewhere else. So which is it? Comforting or not so comforting? Assuring or threatening? And who gets to decide which it is? The starting question for us needs to be, What does Jesus mean when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? But before we can get to that place, we need to understand what Jesus says before that. Before he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he begins by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God Believe also in me. And that's where we can find ourselves stumbling. Believe in God. Believe also 
in me. That word believe can be kind of tricky. For those of us who live in the western part of the world, to believe something means to look at the facts of a situation and based on those facts, develop a belief about the situation. So for example, at Christmas time, I need to believe in the reality of Santa Claus if I'm going to expect him to show up with everything that's on my wish list this year. A more seasonally appropriate example would be where I would look at the weather channel, see that there's a 75% chance of rain, and develop a belief that I would be wise to pack an umbrella. When we plug that word believe into a theological setting, we end up turning to an established set of doctrine. We see this most clearly in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and so on. Belief becomes what we believe about God the Father, about Jesus Christ, and about the Holy Spirit. However, the Greek word used in this passage has nothing to do with that kind of belief. The Greek word Jesus uses is pistis, and its more accurate meaning is trust. Listen to that verse again with this new understanding. Jesus says, trust in God, trust also in me. No wonder he can begin by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. When we fully trust God, nothing can trouble us because we have faith that God will get us through. I hope you know that we can trust God and we can trust Jesus, who is the incarnation of God. And if we trust Jesus, then we know that his way is the best way. We know that the truth he represents is the truth that will set us free. And we know that by following him, we will experience the kind of life, abundant life, that God intends for us. The life that can only come from trusting in God. If we understand Jesus' words through the lens of trust rather than through the lens of intellectual belief, the rest of this passage begins to take on a whole different meaning. A meaning that will turn our faith life into a heart issue rather than a head issue. And that's the foundation upon which I want us now to look at the words of verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way. If we trust Jesus to be the way to real life, the life God intends for us, then we will want to follow him. Knowing Jesus as the way isn't about believing the right doctrine so we can get into heaven. Knowing that Jesus is the way means that we trust Jesus to, to help us walk in the way of God's kingdom in this life. Understanding that, we realize that we need to know how to follow Jesus, how to live as he lived, how to love as he loved, and how to be the kind of person he modeled for us when he walked on this earth. If you've heard me preach or teach before, you know that this is where I usually emphasize the importance of Bible study, especially studying the Gospels. 
Today, though, I want to offer you a synopsis of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. It's the synopsis we reenact every time we celebrate Holy Communion. When we come to the table of Holy Communion, we hear the words, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. We remember how Jesus did this at what we call the Last Supper. We know that this happened just before his death on the cross. And we remember that upon taking the bread, Jesus said, this is my body given for you. What Jesus did to that loaf of bread is what was also occurring in and through his own body. Jesus was taken. That is, he became human as the one chosen by God for the purpose of bringing about God's redemption of all creation. Jesus was blessed. At his baptism and at his transfiguration, God spoke over him these words of blessing. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was broken. His body was broken through the torture he experienced before and during his death on the cross. But his heart was also broken. It was broken open by the suffering, oppression, and sin happening all around him. Finally, Jesus was given. His life was sacrificed on the cross so that we might know the depth of God's love for us and God's desire to forgive us and to make us whole. Like that loaf of bread, Jesus was taken, blessed, broken, and given. If we trust that Jesus is the way, then our lives need to follow that same pattern. We must allow Jesus to take us, to choose us for the work God would have us do. We must submit ourselves fully to God for God's redemptive purposes in the world in whatever way God chooses to do so. We must receive God's blessing. Now, we might wish that God's blessing was what the prosperity gospel claims that it is, that is, health, wealth, and a shiny red Porsche. But God's blessing is really being claimed as God's children and hearing God speak those words over us. You are my beloved child. In you, I am well pleased. We must be broken. Ah, there's the rub, as they say. We must be broken. We must allow our hearts to be broken open by the pain, the suffering, the oppression and sin it is all around us. And sometimes we must allow our bodies to be broken by those who violently oppose the way of God. It is this kind of brokenness that we see in the lives of some of the saints. Saints like Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, John Lewis, and Mother Teresa. Our brokenness will come through the wounds that we receive from the world as we seek to live out God's love. And it will come through experiencing the pain and suffering that is simply a part of everyone's life 
in this world. However our brokenness comes, we must be broken by the world so that God can use us more fully for the redemption of God's creation. Our brokenness is not the ends, though. It is, rather, the means. Once broken, we must be given. It isn't enough for us to be broken through life's circumstances. If we use our brokenness as an excuse to hide away from the world, bury our heads in the sand, and to, to walk away from the pain of others, then our brokenness is for nothing. The process is only complete when we give our brokenness to God for God's loving purposes in the world. When we do so, we will discover the joy that lies beneath the suffering. We will discover that God redeems even the most tragic events in our lives and uses them for good. Now, this doesn't mean that God causes the tragic events or that God desires our brokenness. Rather, just as it was for Jesus, brokenness comes to us all through the difficulties of this life. And because the world as it now exists tends to despise and to reject the ways of God. Trusting that Jesus is the way then, we will follow him as we too are taken, blessed, broken, and given, all for God's good purposes. Jesus also said, I am the truth. Notice that he didn't say, I know the truth, or I teach the truth. He said, I am the truth. For us to know the truth, then, we don't need to get all the facts right. We don't need to fully understand church doctrine. If we are to know the truth, we need to know Jesus. And that only happens when we live in a growing and loving relationship with Jesus. Trusting that Jesus is the truth, we can follow in his way of being taken, blessed, broken, and given. Because we can trust that this way of life is the path of God's kingdom. And we need to trust it if we're going to live it. The way of God's kingdom is so foreign to everything we've ever been taught about life, that it is impossible for us to accept it on our own. Believe me, the world thinks we are absolutely out of our minds when we seek to live out Jesus' teachings. Teachings like love your enemy, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Care for the vulnerable and the weak. Bless those who curse you. Such teachings sound like so much fluff and nonsense to the world, and the world will persecute you when you live them out. But if we trust that Jesus is the truth, we won't care what the world thinks. We will do what seems ridiculous and illogical because we know that the one who is the truth is leading us. Finally, Jesus said, 
I am the life. The life he's talking about here, it isn't the life of the Cleaver family on Leave it to Beaver. It isn't the life of the Kardashians. It's not even the life that we might see on the so-called reality show, The Real World. The life Jesus offers us is the abundant life of God's kingdom. It's the life in which we love others, including our enemies, because we are loved by God. It's the life in which we are willing to suffer for the well-being of others, because we know that God suffers for us. It's the life that is defined by what the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And it is the eternal life, the life lived in God's presence, beginning right here, right now, and continuing throughout eternity. To trust that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life then isn't about what we need to believe in our minds so that we can get into heaven when we die. It's about how we choose to live right now so that we can know the joy of God's presence every moment of every day in every situation. God isn't trying to keep people out. God is doing everything possible to welcome people in. And God wants us to help with that. That's why it's good news. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now the darkness fades.